Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hoover Institution. My name is Samuel Tadros. I'm a distinguished visiting fellow in Middle Eastern studies here at the Hoover Institution. The Hoover Institution is an institution that's dedicated to two main ideas, economic prosperity and securing the world for freedom, two ideas that are deeply linked. With its distinguished scholars, with its world-renowned library, it attempts to bring these, the work of its scholars um, to the Washington, D.C. policy community through our office here in Washington, D.C. Today, we will be discussing Russia and its Islamic world, from the Mongol conquest <clears throat> to the Syrian military campaign, Robert Service's important new book. Russia's relationship with Islam and Muslims is old, but also one fraught with conflict. From the Golden Horde sweeping the lands of the Kievan Rus in 1240, the wars of liberation from the Tatar yoke, the expansion of Tsarist Russia into Muslim-majority lands in the Caucasus and Central Asia, to the bloody conflict in Chechnya, and from Russia's meddling in the affairs of the Ottoman Empire as the protector of the empire's orthodox communities, the Soviet Union's alliance with Muslim-majority countries in the Third World and its disastrous intervention in Afghanistan, to Putin's intervention in Syria in 1215, Russia's domestic and foreign policies have had to deal with the question of Islam. We are fortunate that Robert Service has decided to bring his deep knowledge of Russian history and politics, tying it together in an unbroken melody from the Mongols to Putin. Robert Service is a noted historian of Russia from the late 19th century to the present day. He has written more than a dozen books on Russia, including such acclaimed works as a trilogy of biographies of Lenin, Stalin, and Trotsky the last of which was awarded the Duff Cooper Prize in 2009. Service received his MA in Modern Languages from the University of Cambridge and an MA and PhD in Government from the University of Essex. Today, he serves as a Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Fellow at, of St. Anthony's College, Oxford. As a matter of logistics, Dr. Service will be saying a few words about his book, after which I will be discussing the book themes with him until about 6.15. I will then open the floor for questions by the audience. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Service for our conversation of his excellent new book. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me here uh, this evening. I, I wrote this book at the invitation of Charles Hill, who used to be the executive assistant of Secretary Schultz. And he said, you really need to stretch your legs a bit and move out of your usual comfort zone. And we need a book on Russia and Islam. And reluctantly, but then increasingly enthusiastically, uh, I said about this task. And the core of my analysis is that we too often think about Russia and the Islamic world either in terms of Russia's foreign policy over the centuries or separately about the Muslims inside Russia, inside the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, or the Russian Federation. And what I thought was only common sense, but hadn't been done, was that there must have been some interaction between domestic and foreign policies. And uh, so what I've tried to do in the book is show that, for example, Russians are much more used to living with Muslims than any other European power. Spain expelled its Muslims uh, centuries ago. Uh, it had more Muslims than any other European country. 
Russia didn't. Russia uh, was first ruled by its Muslims, but then came to rule them. And although it treated them roughly to start with, it found that it had, had to accommodate itself to them. But it had accommodated itself in a, a way that was thought oppressive by those Muslim subjects of the Tsar. Uh, and it furthermore wanted to expand its territory uh, in the age of imperial expansions uh, so that it pushed its domains further and further southwards, further and further eastwards, uh, and took in more and more Muslims in, in the same process, so that without really meaning to, it became more and more Muslim as it expanded. And that brought it to a point in the 19th century when uh, the biggest revolts against Tsarism uh, were by either the Poles in the middle of the 19th century uh, or by Muslims, uh, Muslims in the North Caucasus. And anyone with a sense of national resentment knows how centuries long can be the feeling that oppression has to be revenged. And so if we bear in mind that the North Caucasus, where Chechnya is a central uh, hotspot, uh, the North Caucasus was finally conquered only at the end of the 1860s. It's not so very long ago. Uh, large parts of then the southern tier of the, Rus the current Russian Federation is populated by Islamized political organizations that don't accept the incorporation of the North Caucasus into the territory of the Russian Federation. We're talking about a very, very volatile situation indeed. Add to that the fact that the Russian Empire in the middle of the 19th century pushed south in influence gathering beyond its own frontiers and wanted to gobble up authority at the expense of the Ottoman Empire, which was the cause of the outbreak of the Crimean War in the 1850s. And subsequently, the defeated Russian Empire, defeated by the British and the French, or at least humbled by the British and the French, nevertheless attacked the Ottoman Empire again in 1876. And what did the Sultan then do? He pronounced a jihad against Russian power. And the same thing happened in the First World War. This is a, um, a part of history that is not usually brought into current politics, but it's very important that the interrelationship, the interaction between the internal and the external is more or less permanent. The Sultan in 1914, when the Ottomans went into the First World War on the side of the central powers, Germany and Austria-Hungary, pronounced a jihad again against the Russians. So not for any sort of um, simple declarative purpose, but actually to cause an uprising, if possible, by uh, fervent Muslim uh, young man against Russian imperial power. And that duly happened in 1916. The biggest revolt against Nicholas II occurred not in 1917, the year that's uh, now the 100th anniversary. It was actually in 1916. 
1916 in Central Asia when conscripted Muslims revolted against Tsarism. So we have here then a, a country that has always had a problem with the Islamic question. And what happened in uh, the Sochi Olympics of uh, 2014, what did the Russians do? They exported their jihadis so as to have a, a peaceful Winter Olympics, so that they could have a splendid, quiet time while they enjoyed the, uh, the world's attention. Uh, what did they do? They offered to the Dagestani jihadis free passage to Turkey, where they would um, enter a prearranged so-called green corridor and enter either Syria or Iraq. Uh, it was the most fatuous, uh, um, dangerous thing they could possibly have done. What was the guarantee that these jihadis would not come back to the uh, uh, Russian Federation when uh, ISIS was eventually uh, defeated? Um, we don't know what the results of this are going to be. So the story of um, this recent um, international adventure of the Russians in Syria. The chickens haven't yet come home to roost. And it's a story that's uh, internal as well as external. And that's what my book is all about. We're now at a, an uh, acute conjuncture in uh, world politics. Uh, the Russians have moved into what uh, was essentially an international vacuum of great powers in the, in the time of uh, President Obama. They uh, are a bruised economic power. They uh, benefited from the year 2000 to uh, the middle of the year 2014 from the unearned good fortune of high oil prices. They are now a, a damaged economic power, but they have modernized their armed forces and they have prioritized foreign adventures in Crimea, eastern Ukraine, and uh, Syria. They have let loose the dogs of nationalism, and the dogs of nationalism are very difficult to put back in the kennel once they have been uh, loosed. Uh, the problem for us now in the West is that any likely successor to Vladimir Putin will have to be a nationalist if he wants to win an election. And Russia has then become a much, an even more problematic figure on the stage of world politics, even than it was in the early 2000s. Again, that's what I've tried to bring out in this book. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's something that we are facing up to now, but we haven't yet um, dealt with uh, practical policies um, that will cope with this new situation. Well, thank you for that. Let me begin by asking about uh, <clears throat> taking you back to the past. Um, there's the, the, the Russia or Moscow, more accurately, as the subject of um, Islam's domination of the Golden Horde. That's Russia. There's Russia on the offensive against the forces of Islam mm. uh, later on. How do Russians see Islam? I know it's a, it's a very broad question. You yeah. dealt with this in the book a bit about how Russian literature yeah. and thinkers um, have this view of Islam. 
How is the religion understood? Well, the, that's, that's really important to, uh, to get a fix on all of this. Um, Russians have a much more literary education than, than um, uh, is the case in most Western countries. So they are brought up re reading Tolstoy's uh, Caucasian tales. It's part of the obligatory uh, curriculum. And Muslims don't come out well from his tales. Uh, but they don't come out badly always. So some of the stories are positive, some of them are negative. But I think most Russian girls and boys aged 13 or 14, when they read Tolstoy's short story, which they have to read, Prisoner of the Caucasus, it's about uh, uh, capture, ransom, wildness, uh, exoticism. Uh, they think of Islam as an alien plant inside their own societies, a, a dangerous alien plant. Probably that's not so unusual for European or American uh, societies, but Russians think about it more than we did until the last 20 or 30 years. It's, it's very interesting to view Islam as, a, as an alien plant when you have a substantial population yes. of Muslims in the country. Um, you, you deal with the, with the numbers a bit in the, in the book. Um, the, the, we don't know for sure how many Muslims there, there are, are in the yes. country. Yeah. Uh, but the question of demography has been on the minds of people a lot when we talk about uh, Russia, when we talk about um, the impact um, of Muslim women having a much higher fertility rate yeah. than Russian women in general. Um, is that something that the Russian leadership thinks about uh, oh, in the future? All the time. Uh, Vladimir Putin repeatedly talks about the need for ethnic Russians by which he basically means people of Christian background, uh, to have more children. And so uh, he wants there to be a bigger proportion of the population uh, than at present to, to inhabit the Russian Federation. And it is the case that Muslim families have larger numbers of children than is the case for people of Christian background. The question of religion is a, a contested one because not all Muslims in the Russian Federation have uh, a particularly strong um, religious commitment. They have more a cultural commitment to the sort of food that they eat, uh, but often they will, for example, uh, drink wine. Uh, the, the Muslims of Tatarstan, in the middle of Russia, where, where the Golden Horde was, um, had one of its big bases in the 14th and 15th century, they are known to be rather relaxed about their Islam, whereas because of the persecution of the Chechens, mm -hmm. uh, radicalization has been rampant there. And uh, it's been very, very brutally dealt with by the representative of Putin, uh, Ramzan Kadyrov. Kadyrov, and um, that's had the effect of pushing uh, radical Islam 
into more and more extreme variants of radicalism. So it's had a counterproductive impact. And that's why so many young men were deported from Chechnya and Dagestan in 2013 in this madhouse scheme to just get rid of them as if they wouldn't come back. I mean, this is what Belgium and Germany and the United Kingdom have, have been dealing with uh, in the last two or three years. That soon, these, if these people are defeated in Iraq and Syria, hundreds of them will somehow manage to come back and they will have dangerously violent intentions. And we don't know yet what the scale of that's going to be. So there are several Islams inside Russia. Mm -hmm. um, communities, as you point mm -hmm. out, differ um, in the historical relationship they have to the Russian state mm. and the treatment of the state to them. But there's also, in a sense, a second or third Islam in terms of the Islam of the Central Asian countries, yes. the former Soviet Union countries, wow. and then another Islam in terms of the surrounding <clears throat> Muslim-majority countries in the Middle East. How much are the three Islams or four Islams tied together in the Russian decision-making? Is foreign policy a reflection of domestic or the reverse, or they, are they managed completely separately from each other? They're, they're always in, entwined with each other. Um, Russia took the view that so long as it could dominate the parts of the Soviet Union that gained their independence, it would actually be cheaper than trying to keep them as part of the, uh, the same single unitary state. And it encouraged the emergence of what can only be called dictatorships in Central Asia that repressed jihadi radicalism. And that has been the case since the fall of the Soviet Union, all through the 1990s and through to the present day. And the risk of this is that oppressive, corrupt dictatorships could produce a reaction in the form of popular uprisings, such as has actually happened sporadically in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and, and elsewhere. So we're not talking about a part of the world where stabilization is necessarily uh, permanent. And part of the problem has been this very, very, I mean, Russia is an authoritarian state. But by comparison with the southern republics, the Central Asian republics, uh, even Kazakhstan, uh, Russia is not as unfree as these other these other newly independent states, which are essentially clan-based dictatorships. And we, we cannot look on this with equanimity, because political explosions in that part of the world, as, as we know from Syria and Iraq, can spread outwards regionally. During the communist years, there was, um, especially in the very early period, there was this attitude of, um, an, or an assumption, that religion would no longer yeah. be important. It wouldn't matter any longer. Mm. People will become modern. They're, they're, they're going to forget about all these mythologies that they believed in. That doesn't happen, obviously. Mm. Um, now, the, the Russian Orthodox Church survives, but more importantly, mm. 
<clears throat> for us here is that Islam remains resilient despite these years of uh, repression, despite the walls of separation between the, the Soviet Muslims and the rest of the Muslim communities worldwide. Why was Islam so resilient and survived under communism? Ah, oh, that's, that's a really good, that's a really good uh, question. Um, the, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church was very hierarchical. It was like a pyramid. Uh, it was run from the top and run in a fairly disciplined fashion. Islam didn't have the same centralized uh, structure. Now, that meant that when the communists said that all religion was bad, it was the opium uh, of the people, then uh, as the totalitarian state pushed its way into the intermediate layers of social organization right at the base, Islam was more resilient than organized Christianity was. And so Islam had uh, the capacity to form small residual self-organized groups with their own imams in a way that was more difficult for especially the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, um, not so much for the other Christian denominations because they too survived mm. in the way that Islam did. But Islam, Islam I, back in the um, <coughs> four or five years ago, I did a book on the end of the Cold War, and I read a lot of Politburo papers from the 1970s and 1980s. And I was very struck at how the Soviet Politburo kept coming back to this question. Why are these people still um, holding their own mm. prayer meetings when we've knocked down their mosques? Why are they still doing this? And they often met in warehouses. Christians were doing this as well, I have to say. Um, but it's, 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 it's partly the lack of hierarchy that meant that a low level of self-organization came naturally to uh, Muslims. And um, uh, the more brutal they were to Islam, and they were brutal in the 1930s, they, uh, they, they, they put the names of all, all imams on the death lists in 1937 to 1938, and all priests, it was all religious figures. Mm -hmm. um, this, this meant that um, uh, the Muslim faith became identified with resistance to oppressive central power. Mm. In 1453, um, Constantinople falls to the Ottoman army, yes. a monumental loss for the Orthodox Christian world. Yes. Um, two uh, decades later, the Moscow wins its victory, its freedom from yes. um, the Tatar yoke. Yeah. The, the image of, of Moscow as the second Constantinople, mm. or as the third, the third Rome yeah. in this sense, um, is often invoked in trying to understand uh, Russia's view of itself. Mm. How much does this idea of the third Rome, the <laughs> protector of Christianity, still play a role in the thinking of Russia's domestic and foreign policy? These are really great questions, Samuel. <laughs> um, President Putin doesn't talk about the Third Rome, but he does claim to be a Russian Orthodox Christian believer. And he does encourage the sort of social traditions that the Russian Orthodox Church has always believed in. So he his view is then 
that the Western powers in the early 2000s made a catastrophic error by importing fashionable Western models into the Middle East on their military campaigns. And he says that Russia is special in the world. This links up to what you're saying about Russia as the third Rome or the second Constantinople. Russia is special in the world because it's the one great power that is not trying to change the social traditions of the countries it seeks to influence. He claims then that this is a special role. It's not messianic in the way that communism was a secular version of messianism. Com communism is going to spread all around the earth and change the whole nature of humanity. He's not saying that. But he is saying something a little weaker, but still distinctive for Russia, that Russia has this role in the world, uh, self-ascribed role, that uh, it can fulfill. It now has a government that um, believes in family, believes in tradition. Uh, and this is propped up by the doctrines of the Russian Orthodox Church. The Russian Orthodox Church really believes in what it believed in in the, in the 18th century, 18th and 19th century. The Russian Orthodox Church does not believe in democracy. It comes close to denouncing democracy. So you can see what the alliance is between the Kremlin uh, and mm -hmm. the Patriarchate uh, at the moment. They, they, they suit each other. The reason I ask about the role of, of Orthodox Christianity and the idea of a new Rome is because, um, as you argue, you, Russia has a, a Muslim policy, yeah. uh, one that sometimes is of containment, sometimes of uh, contr uh, attempted control, sometimes of mm -hmm. conflict and war with them. But it also seems to have a policy uh, targeting Orthodox Christians worldwide. There's a competition always between the patriarch in Moscow and the ecumenical patriarch yes. based on con in Istanbul today. Uh, the Russian church or Russia attempted to be a protector, a mother to Orthodox communities throughout the Middle East. Today, um, a similar image is spread among yeah. Middle Eastern Christians. Outreach to Egypt's Copts, uh, to the Syrian Christians, an image of Russia as a protector of these Christian communities throughout the Middle East that are facing, well, extinction. How much are these two policies inherently contradictory and bound to, to come to conflict with each other? I think Russia is opportunistic. I think the priority for the Kremlin is to gain influence around the world and respect around the world. Russia suffered humiliation in the 1990s. So however it takes, whoever's in the Kremlin wants to restore international influence and international prestige and international respect. So for years after he came to power in 2000, Vladimir Putin said that Russia stood for legitimism for the maintenance of all existing states without external interference. 
and he had in mind <coughs> discouraging interference in the Russian Federation. I mean, that was the big uh, priority for him. Uh, and he was drawn into saying, and this is what foreign states ought to be doing in Syria. Uh, Assad's regime is in power. It should be kept in power. And that if the Pandora's box is opened up by a, a military operation, by an external uh, intervention, then all hell could be let loose. But then he invaded Crimea. He broke, broke with his own principle of legitimism. And he invaded a country that his predecessor, Yeltsin, had guaranteed uh, the territorial security of. And last week, he spoke about Catalonia in the opposite way. You'd think that if he th thinks that there's a principle of uh, referendum, of plebiscite, whereby uh, a segment of a nation can say, we want our self-determination. And that's what happened in Crimea. He held a plebiscite. He held a referendum. Uh, then he would offer the same thing as a policy to the Catalonians. But he didn't. He said that the Spanish national government ought to handle things differently, but ought to uh, have its rights respected. Now, there's inconsistency here, except if you bear in mind that the, the bigger objective is get international influence, get international respect, get international fear by whatever means mm -hmm. you can and do whatever it takes in each individual case. So he's a devious maneuverer. I mean, I'm not breaking into any secret realm here. I mean, uh, this is pretty obvious. <coughs> I mean, this is a man who is assiduous. He's hardworking. He's a workaholic. I don't know if any of you saw the Oliver Stone um, soft soap job on him. Uh, there are a few little things in there that we didn't know before. For example, we didn't know that there have been five assassination attempts on the man. I mean, if, if it's true. Uh, because the other thing about him is he's a bare-faced liar. And the other thing, again, is that he was a lieutenant colonel in the KGB. So he, even if he wasn't a natural liar, he's a trained liar. Uh, well, he's, he's... He is an astonishing man. I mean, we have to... Sorry to... No, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think we shouldn't underestimate someone like this. If you rule a country as big as that, a ninth of the world's Earth's surface, it's a huge, huge country for basically 17 years without any serious problem to your personal supremacy, then you've got to be clever. So a clever man like Putin, he's seen his predecessors, the, the Tsars, the, the communist leaders. They've tried many policies with these local Muslims they have in the country. They've uh, caught at some. They've clashed with others. They've uh, attempted forced modernization. They've attempted forced immigration, migration of them. And the more they press, the problem hasn't disappeared. Um, what did Putin learn from that long experience that his predecessors had to deal with a bomb ticking inside their own country? Well, clever he might be, but consistent he's not. And some, in some ways, he 
accommodates to Islam. If you go to Kazan now, there's a great mosque in the Kazan Kremlin, uh, as it has been for centuries, but now it's restored in all its magnificence. That's the Kazan Mosque there on the front of the book. Uh, so there's freedom of religious um, practice uh, for Muslims. But tell that to the Chechens. It's been turned into a lunar landscape. Uh, they're building skyscrapers in uh, Chechnya, but they've murdered hundreds of young uh, Chechens, thousands of young uh, Chechens. They've wrecked family after family in the 1990s. This is not just in Putin's time, it's in Yeltsin's time as well. Yeltsin reckoned that this was the, yeah, he says this somewhere in his memoirs, this was the biggest mistake of his presidency. Um, Yeltsin had the capacity for, it was a much more, um, when he wasn't. Um, drunk. Drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Yeltsin in the early 2000s when his wife was accompanying him to uh, Britain. And his wife was a very good chaperone, kept him in line. And he, he was a very, very thoughtful, aging Russian um, politician. And, the one thing I took from the conversation I had with him was that in a mild way, he said, he regretted the lapse into authoritarianism that was taking place. This was in the early 2000s. Well, it's, it's more than a lapse, isn't it? It's, um, mm. it's a very authoritarian state. You, politicians who who thwart the purposes in a basic way of Vladimir Putin, they, they don't last very long in this life. Nemtsov being the last great liberal figure, there aren't really any outstanding democratic figures um, on the public scene anymore. They've all been muted. Mm -hmm. or killed. Let me take you to, to foreign policy here. Um, early on in the, in the beginning of the 2000s, there was an attempt of outreach uh, to the Muslim world. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. The Russia becomes an observer member of the yeah. Organization of Islamic Countries. Yeah. Um, there's this quote that you mentioned in the book by the Foreign Minister Lavrov of um, how building better relations with the Muslim world was a key objective or strategic objective of, of Russia. Yeah. Any goodwill built seems to be now lost because of the Syria conflict where yes. Russia is siding with a minority dictator uh, who's oppressing a majority Sunni population. Yeah. Um, yeah. Doesn't this weigh on Russia's decision at all? The fact that it can alienate um, millions, a billion Muslims worldwide? It doesn't seem to have done so. Um, they, we look in vain for total consistency and the uh, the baffling aspect of this uh, whole policy is that in backing Assad uh, Putin has chosen to support Shia and pro Shia uh, elements in Syria whereas the vast majority of Russian Muslims are Sunni. And um, that really counts in Chechnya. It probably will count in Dagestan. Um, 
who knows what's going to happen in Tatarstan and Crimea. In Crimea, there are Muslims in uh, Crimea. We don't yet know. These things could have a long-term consequence that they haven't calculated for. Um, I always think that um, we tend to forget how recently the North Caucasus was conquered. Tatarstan was conquered in the 15th century. What we now call Tatarstan was conquered in the 15th century. But uh, the North Caucasus was subdued only at the end of the, of the 1860s, and revolts occurred in the North Caucasus in 1905, 1918, all through the 1920s. The last armed op um, opposition to Stalin in the 1930s was in Central Asia, was, was mu religious, Muslim, jihadi, you can call it, revolts against Stalin by the Bashmachi in Central Asia. So this, is, this isn't quite sort of ancient history. It's recent stuff. This, this comment about the, the Sunni Shia dynamic mm. brings me to probably my favorite quote from the book uh, by no other than Saddam Hussein, the president, former mm. president of Iraq, when he tells uh, the visiting uh, yeah. Russian foreign yeah. minister, uh, may Allah help you, only let it be our Allah yeah. and not the Iranian one. Yeah. Now, Saddam, <laughs> Saddam, of course, cares deeply, others in the region obviously care deeply about the, the Sunni-Shia divide. Now Russia doesn't seem to have an Islam policy, it has a Shia policy. Yeah. It's allied with Hezbollah, it's allied mm. with Bashar al-Assad, it's allied with Iran. Again, it's, a, it's an alliance that, um, that makes sense on, a, on the backing an ally in the Middle East, but it's also one fraught with, uh, with challenges for Russia. Yeah because of that Sunni-Shia rivalry going on. Absolutely. And when uh, Shiva Nadza, the foreign minister, went on his big Asian tour in 1989, and he came across these things, these, these discrepancies between one sort of Islam uh, from another sort of Islam, this was a new world for him, because he'd been brought up as a, a Georgian. He was a Georgian and um, as a, a militant atheist, because he was a communist. So it was um, a, new, a new world for him. And, well, what on earth did Saddam really believe? But he made this, this uh, quip about he hoped that the Allah would be his sort of Allah and not called the Sunni God. Of, yeah. <laughs> and, and when he arrived in Iran, Shavanadza was snubbed by Ayatollah Khomeini. The, the Iranians knew how to deal with this upstart Russian communist uh, reformer. Um, one thing that I think comes out of all of this is that um, great powers can far too easily assume that client states will do what they're told. And they underestimate how uh, a Syria or an Iraq or a Libya can actually take their own initiatives and say to the great power, the USSR, we've done this, now, you, now you've got to keep on helping us. You've given us armaments, we can't pay. You're going to have to forgive us our debts. Russia forgave Iraq its... Um, armaments debt in the early 2000s. Um, it's, it's, it's not so easy to manage the Middle East in terms of 19th century uh, conceptions. Um, uh, so, so Russia has, has got into this region of the world since its military intervention in Syria in 2015. And it's going to have its hands full, I think. I mean, that's what you're implying, uh, I think. And I, I agree. A price, I, a price I, will have to be paid. It will pay a price, yeah. And it won't just be a, 
financial price? I mean, the one price that I can think of, um, of course, he's avoided, Putin has avoided uh, military engagements, the kind that require yeah. ground troops. Ground he's troops. learned the Afghanistan lesson yeah. or the American lesson in Iraq. But, um, but a Russian jet was bombed yeah. in October of 2015. 224 Russians from St. Petersburg died in that explosion yeah. at the hands of the local affiliate of the Islamic State. And that's bound to, to continue as, uh, as his involvement grows in Syria. I think it's now uh, time to open the floor for questions by the audience. So please raise your hand. A mic will come to you. Please identify yourself, and then you can ask your question. Yeah, hi, I'm Mike Irochus, a retired federal employee. From 2012 to 2016, I was flying back and forth to, to Russia for the State Department. Um, St. Petersburg, Moscow, um, Yekaterinburg, Katherinburg, and also Sochi. And one comment and then one question. Uh, before the Sochi Olympics, we really expected that there would be a terrorist event. And I went there about five or six times, and um, we never saw a lot of security, not a lot of, not a lot of Russian military, until the actual event started. And we always expected something was going to happen. And your comments about the corridor of the... Um, uh, getting the jihadists out of out yeah. of that area is, is is very enlightening, but the thing that I noticed in in all the other cities, the big cities that I visited, I didn't see any mosques. So my question is, is the Russian society integrating the Muslim religion into these big cities, and are they building mosques? They are. They are. Uh, they are building mosques in cities which have a pre-existing large Muslim um, population. Where uh, that's not the case, the Muslim communities have usually had the prudence not to push Russian popular opinion too hard. So there's a sort of um, a calculus that goes on. Uh, and the Russian Orthodox Church um, is hostile to the building of mosques. So that's a factor too, because the Kremlin tries to keep the Russian Orthodox Church on side. The Russian Orthodox Church gets privileges from the Kremlin in return. So it's a uh, it's that kind of relationship. So back in the early 90s, uh, there used to be uh, a Saturday morning religious program after the fall of communism. And I do remember seeing one Saturday morning program where an imam gave a, an explanation of Islam. And he was dressed as an imam. That doesn't happen now. Um, but you only have to look at this Kazan mosque. I mean, it's a, it's a, but St. Petersburg, it's, Moscow. Uh, there are mosques in both those places, but not very many. Not proportionate to the population. No, no. That's a, it's a really important point you raise there. It's, it's, a sensitive, it's a sensitive issue. I mean, a lot of people who identify themselves as Orthodox Christians don't go to church. Um, they, they just feel they are ethnic Russians, and therefore they ought to put this down on their, um, their uh, forms. Uh, but they... So, so religion isn't as as vigorously practiced as it is talked about. Um, it's talked about more than it is actually practiced. Mm. But as I uh, as I was saying, in Tatarstan, that's the case for a lot of these very quiet Muslim communities, who seem to enjoy the same habits as the Christian, the Russian Christians. Mm. 
I mean, this is a huge country. I mean, it used to be a sixth of the world's Earth's surface. It's now only a ninth, only a ninth. It's a huge, huge country. It has immense variety. I always think that, you know, whenever I think I've got my head round the Russian Federation. Tell myself, don't kid yourself. This, um, there's always an exception. Hello, my name is uh, Joseph Hammond, and I'm a journalist uh, with the American Media Institute. Uh, but in 2011, I was working for uh, Radio Free Europe, and one of the things I remember very clearly is debate between Medvedev and Putin about the war in Libya. At yeah. the time, Obama was preparing to the invasion of Libya, and you have Medvedev, who was very supportive of kind of that policy, while Putin described it as a crusade, using very loaded language. Um, was that a real difference between those two? And is that evocative of an actual debate on, pol on you know, debate on policy toward the Islamic world within the Kremlin? Um, or is this just, you know, uh, something that was done uh, for uh, public consumption um, and not an actual policy debate. No, uh, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, back in 2011, there was what you might call vacillation inside the Kremlin elite as to whether it would be sensible for uh, a constitutional amendment which would enable Putin to um, uh, rule forever. Uh, Medvedev seems to have fancied his chances, uh, whereby he would stay on as president. He would stand for election again. And he called the, the leading businessman to a meeting, I think in the summer, sometime in the summer of 2011, and he said, look, what about it? And there was a deathly silence. And at that point, he knew that there was no chance. Um, now, he didn't want to stand just for personal reasons. There, he always has had a more, a more urgent commitment to introducing the rule of law and uh, a more accommodating attitude to the United States than Putin had from about 2004. We have to remind ourselves in 2000 through to 2003, Putin himself was uh, following that line of policy. I mean, we all remember George W. Bush's uh, remark about seeing into the depths of uh, Mr. Putin's soul. Um, well, it was two-sided. There was uh, a certain... Uh, Putin has hardened since then. Putin has become a much more um, fixatedly anti-American figure than Medvedev. But Medvedev's part of the same ruling elite. These are slight shadings of difference, but I think they were real in the year 2011. It, it was a real um, possible division. And Putin just trundled his political tanks all over Med Medvedev and said, listen, chum, the best thing you can hope for is to be prime minister again uh, if you're lucky toe the line, or you're finished. Uh, P Putin is a, he doesn't take uh, prisoners. David Talbot from the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. Um, professor, I'm wondering if you would be willing to comment on why Putin uh, and, and his regime didn't really mark the centenary of the Bolshevik ah. Revolution in a way that we might have expected. Yeah. God, these are terrific questions. Uh, I was in um, Moscow in January, and I thought the, the whole point of the conference I went to would be to sort of say something about the 100 years that had passed since the 1917 revolution. Uh, it hardly got a mention. 
uh, I went into the big bookshop in, it's very near where the FSB uh, headquarters are of, of the Lubyanka in central Moscow to the Russian history section. And I, I started counting up uh, what kind of books were on sale on Russian history. About half of them were about Stalin or Stalinism. Uh, something like a fifth to a quarter were about Nicholas II. There was hardly anything about the 1917 revolution. There were very, very arcane, recondite, technical monographs on the 1917 revolution, but there wasn't any sort of great amount of popular history. Uh, the authorities have tried to wish the revolutions away. Putin himself has called the execution of Nicholas II as a tragedy. We're talking about Vladimir Putin, the ex-communist, the ex-KGB man, who is now an anti-communist, who is speaking up for uh, the victims of communism. He's done a, a personal somersault, an unbelievable personal somersault, and it's, it's in his self-interest to do it. I mean, why should he want a revolution to be fated, to be um, celebrated? He, he is terrified that his regime could go the same way. These, these sudden explosions of popular fury, 1905, 1917, 1921, they are to be feared by Russian rulers. And what, and what, do, what do Russian people feel? They feel personally approving of Putin. He gets terrific personal approval ratings, 80% sometimes. But if you look at what Russians say about corruption or injustice or the feeling of being left behind by rich business, rip-off merchants, then actually rulers in the Kremlin today have got every reason to feel fearful, um, which is one of the reasons why they've been tempted into uh, foreign military adventures, because it distracts public attention from these grievances that people have. You only have to go, go to Yekaterinburg or uh, wherever in Russia, and you hear the same story. It's, it's not, it's not a fair deal that Russians, ordinary Russians, are getting. Um, so I, I think they've tried to sort of draw a veil over the 1917 revolution, mm -hmm. and they've, they've got good political reasons to do that. Um, Nicholas Romero, U.S. Air Force. Um, thank you for your, your talk. Uh, my question is, uh, I, I think you, you aptly um, note Putin's opportunism. My question for you is, uh, Hoover Institution uh, hosted Graham Allison er, earlier in the year, and his, his latest book is on the Thucydides trap. And we typically frame the Thucydides trap in a US-China framework. But uh, with China's One Belt, yeah. One Road grand strategy yeah. and its expansion into Muslim-majority countries in the Eurasia, uh, region, um, what sort of Thucydides trap might you imagine and what sort of opportunism might we see out of Putin in Muslim-majority countries in which uh, Russian influence might wane as a result of Chinese encroachment? Uh, I think that is really the big, the big geostrategic question for Russian rulers since the turn of the millennium. And I feel that looked at clinically, the long-term menace to Russian power is in Beijing. It's not with America that Russia shares a frontier. It's with China. 
and China has a dynamic and diversified economy that Russia can only dream of. Russia has every reason to fear the long-term pretensions of Chinese power. And from that point of view, therefore, Putin has pushed his country down uh, the wrong geostrategic route. Uh, he felt bruised by the way that Russia was treated in the 1990s, like most Russians do. But sometimes rulers have to say, I'll take the punch. Uh, I'll roll with the, uh, I'll roll with the, uh, I'll roll against the ropes, and I'll come back, and I'll make this partnership with America and Europe work. And he he has chosen exactly the opposite geostrategic option, and he is making as much mischief as he can. Um, Le Pen in France, uh, the Brexit tweets in the United Kingdom, my country. He's been at it in Montenegro. Uh, he's tried to split the Hungarians from the embrace of the EU with, by giving them a massive and unbelievably generous loan to build atomic nuclear clear power stations there. This, this is really um, uh, a geostrategic disaster for Russia in the long term because its, it's, it's long-term needs are to have friends in the world other than China. It's only chosen China um, as a warm friend since it had all sorts of trouble following the Crimean annexation. The Chinese don't regard Russia with quite the warm feelings that Putin says that he feels towards Beijing. I think it's a disastrous, a disastrous, um, I see it as a cul-de-sac. I mean, this is a man who has basically be in charge of his country for 17 years. In 17 years, where's the diversification of the economy? I mean, he says in speech after speech, if we're going to be a power in the world, we've got to be a technological power. Well, why hasn't it happened? Why haven't the words been followed by action? And whose responsibility is it? that there isn't the rule of law in Russia. Why, why should foreign investment go pouring into Russia when the conditions for uh, business are, are so poor? And whose responsibility is that? So that would be my answer to your question about the Thucydides trap. You know, um, um, Russia, Russia under Putin should have been more like Russia under Yeltsin and sought out partnership and known how to take the humbling and say, saying to itself, this won't last forever. I'm not going to let it last forever. I mean, I feel sorry for the Russian people, but not for Russian rulers. That's <laughs> been the case for well over a hundred years. On that note, we end our discussion here today. Thank you for your participation. Uh, the reception is, will be open again now, and uh, Dr. Service will be here to sign your book copies if you'd like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.